Hello all, welcome to Shankara Ace Academy's YouTube channel. Before starting our Hindu daily news analysis for today, I have an announcement for you all. This is about the pre-storming test series brought to you by Shankara Ace Academy. Yes, yet another batch of pre-storming is going to commence from March 5th of this month. Interested aspirants who have not enrolled in any of the test series till now can make use of this opportunity and register. Totally 25 tests will be included in this test series. So, Aspirants kindly make use of this opportunity and register. The registration link and other details of this batch is provided in the description of this video. Now, with this information, let us get into the today's article discussion. These are the articles which we are going to discuss today. Now, let us start with the first article for the day. Now, let us take this article for our discussion. It is about the proton beam therapy for cancers. According to the article, proton beam therapy is considered a viable alternative to the radiation therapy for treating solid cancer tumors. Especially, this particular type of treatment is more effective in head and neck cancers. Patients with cancers of prostate, ovaries, breasts, lungs, bones and soft tissues have also seen promising results in terms of recovery through this particular therapy. But there are two major problems associated with proton beam therapy. One is the lack of facilities and the other is the humongous cost associated with this new treatment. This is what is given in this article. So, in this discussion, we will try to see about the new kind of cancer treatment called the proton beam therapy. See, as the name suggests, proton beam therapy uses protons to treat cancers. So, it is a type of radiation therapy. Normally, X-rays are used to treat cancers, but in the case of this therapy, protons are used. Now, let us understand how proton therapy works. Know that fundamentally all tissue cells are made of molecules. And these molecules are made up of atoms which is their building blocks. As we all know, in the center of every atom there will be a nucleus. And the particle which orbits the nucleus of the atom are negatively charged and they are called as electrons. Now, when energized proton which is present in the nucleus passes near the orbiting electrons, the positive charge of the protons attracts the negatively charged electrons. This particular case which I had said now will lead to pulling out of the electrons from the orbits in which they have been rotating around the nucleus. This particular process is only known as ionization. It changes the characteristics of the atom itself and when the characteristic of the atom is changed it leads to the change in character of the larger molecule. This is because as I already said molecules are made up of atoms. So, when atoms are affected, then molecules will also be affected. And because of this ionization, there will be changes in the DNAs which are present inside the cells. Damaging the DNA means destroying the specific cell functions, particularly the ability to divide or proliferate. So, by ionization, the ability to divide or reproduce of the cells is affected. See, both normal and cancerous cells go through repair process when their reproduction ability is affected. But the point here to note is that cancer cells ability to repair molecular injury is inferior when compared to normal cells. As a result, cancer cells are more permanently damaged and subsequently cell death occurs. But this is not the case with normal cells. Normal cells will undergo repair process and they will increase their cell population. And this is how proton therapy is used to treat cancer specific cells. Now, before concluding, we will see the major benefit associated with proton therapy over X-rays. See, the major benefit associated with proton therapy is the exposure to minimal radiation when compared with the X-rays. Now, look at this image. On the left, X-ray therapy is given. See, initially, the dosage in X-ray therapy is high. So, it affects the healthy cells which are present before the tumor. And after this only, it comes into contact with the actual cancer tumor. The initial interaction of the X-ray with healthy cell causes damage to the healthy cell due to the X-ray's high radiation. This will lead to healthy cell getting more affected than the tumor cells. Now, look at the right side of this image. It shows the proton therapy. The initial dosage is not high here and the entire energy is released only in the tumor area. And also note that the proton therapy induced radiation does not penetrate beyond the cancerous cells. Look at this graph also. It also explains the same thing which I had said till now. Here, the brown line indicates the proton dosage and the blue line indicates the X-ray dosage. 
see how the blue line extends beyond the tumor area and the brown line cuts itself out just after the end of the tumor area and in this way proton therapy minimizes the damage caused to the healthy cells this is the major benefit associated with proton therapy over conventional x-ray radiation treatment if you want to know more about the side effects and application of proton therapy then watch our hindu daily news analysis for the date 25th of september 2022 with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we have seen about proton therapy and its benefits with these learned points in mind now let's move on to the next article discussion yesterday the ministry of electronics and information technology launched the grievance appellate committee portal under the it rules 2021 so people who are dissatisfied with the resolution of complaints to social media companies regarding content takedown requests can now appeal to grievance appellate committee in this backdrop let us understand the steps involved in grievance redressal mechanism in relation to a social media intermediary see the 2021 it rules mandates the social media intermediaries to establish a grievance redressal mechanism for receiving complaints from the users or victims these intermediaries can appoint a grievance officer to deal with such complaints and share the name and contact details of such officer on their portal so any person aggrieved by the content of a publisher may file a complaint with the social media intermediary through the grievance redressal mechanism to the grievance officer of the particular company here the grievance officer should acknowledge the complaint within 24 hours and resolve it within 15 days from its receipt Let me explain to you this concept using an example so that you can understand it better. Let's say a obscene photo of you is published in a social platform. Before the introduction of this particular rules, if you want to file a complaint against the publisher to take down the photo, you need to file a complaint to the headquarters of the company. Normally social media companies headquarters are located in their home countries. So this is a cumbersome process. This is why Indian government through the IT rules 2021 introduced a concept of grievance redressal mechanism through this concept it made the social media intermediaries to appoint a grievance officer for this specific purpose so from now on users from india for any content removal queries can contact this grievance officer of the particular social media company but what if the decision of the grievance officer is not satisfactory to the user or the complaint is not addressed within the specified time can the user appeal against the decision of the grievance officer to a higher authority see the simple answer to this question is yes this is where grievance appellate committee comes into picture see earlier the user can appeal against the decision of the grievance officer in the courts since our courts are already overburdened the ministry of electronics and information technology recently amended the it rules to aid in the establishment of grievance appellate committees So basically the grievance appellate committee is set up to provide an alternative to a user to file an appeal against the decision of the grievance officer rather than directly going to the court of law but remember the proposed IT rules 2021 does not restrict the user from directly approaching courts under the act three grievance appellate committees will be set up and the complaint can be heard by any of these three committees Each committee will have a chairperson, two old-time members from different government entities, and retired senior executives from the industry for a term of three years from the date of assumption of office. All the members of the grievance appellate committees are appointed by the union government themselves. Coming back, if a user is not satisfied with the ruling of the grievance officer, then he can appeal to the grievance appellate committee within period of thirty days. The grievance appellate committee in their part should resolve the appeal made by the user within 30 days to arrive at a decision the grievance appellate committee can take assistance from people with necessary qualifications and experience on the subject matter once decision is made the social media intermediaries must comply with the orders of the grievance appellate committee and also note that a report highlighting the steps taken by the social media intermediary should also be updated in their websites See the dispute resolution mechanism adopted by the grievance appellate committee is digital in nature so the appeal against the order of grievance officer of a social media intermediary can be made online and the order issued by the grievance appellate committee will also be made only in the online medium remember a user can approach the grievance appellate committee only if the grievance has not been satisfactorily addressed by the intermediary see the user cannot directly appeal to the grievance appellate committee 
This is all you need to know about grievance officers and grievance appellate committees. Through this discussion, we came to know about the term grievance officers and also about newly introduced mechanism called the grievance appellate committees. With all these points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Now take a look at this editorial displayed here. It talks about a new agreement called the Windsor Framework signed between the European Union and the United Kingdom. So in this discussion, we will try to understand the background of this agreement and also we will try to see about the protocols that governs the movement of goods between the Great Britain, Northern Ireland and the European Union. Firstly, you should have an understanding about what is United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. See, Great Britain is an island consisting of England, Wales and Scotland. Northern Ireland is not part of Great Britain. However, the United Kingdom also includes Northern Ireland apart from England, Wales and Scotland. So, United Kingdom is much broader a word when compared with Great Britain. Here note that the Republic of Ireland is altogether a separate country. Now, let us look at the history of Northern Ireland and how it came into being. As many of you already know, Britain was one of the mightiest colonial power of the yesteryears. During this period only, the entire island of Ireland was brought under the control of British colonizers. During the early decades of 20th century, there emerged a nationalistic movement among the people of Ireland. This resulted in the Irish War of Independence. As a result of it, the island of Ireland was bifurcated and the present Republic of Ireland was granted independence by the British in the 1920s. Here, the Northern Ireland remained within the administrative control of Britain. This is due to the presence of people with English ancestries living in the Northern Ireland. Here note that Northern Ireland contained two groups of people. One were called as Unionists and the other were called as Nationalists. The Unionists wanted Northern Ireland to stay within the broader United Kingdom. And on the other hand, Nationalists wanted it to become part of the newly independent Republic of Ireland. Because of the difference in ideology of these two warring groups, from the late 1960s onwards, there emerged an armed conflict between the groups. This armed conflict resulted in huge scale violence. This period lasted for nearly 30 years. Finally, an agreement was signed for bringing cooperation between the two communities living in Northern Ireland. This agreement was only called as the famous Good Friday Agreement. It brought the violence to an end by establishing a devolved power sharing administration and it also created new institutions for cross-border cooperation between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. It basically allowed for free movement of goods and people between Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. This is all about the Good Friday Agreement. All went well until the United Kingdom decided to leave the European Union. See, this was done after the Brexit referendum which the people of United Kingdom voted for with a majority of 52%. See, before Brexit, the trade between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland was easy. This was because both were in the zone of European Union. Because of this, they shared the same trade rules. So, the trade was relatively easy. But after the implementation of Brexit, Northern Ireland became the only part of UK that have a land border with an EU country which is nothing but the Republic of Ireland. Because of this, checks were required on goods transported between United Kingdom and the European Union's markets. But this could not happen in the Irish border. This is because of the Good Friday Agreement. If new checkpoints are placed on the Irish border, then the cross-border cooperation could be threatened. So, a new deal was required to prevent any new checks between the Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. Therefore, a new deal called the Northern Ireland Protocol was made. Under the Northern Ireland Protocol, a different type of border check was introduced. According to this protocol, the inspections were not to be carried out at the Irish border. Rather, the inspection and document checks were carried out at the Northern Ireland ports. This applied to goods travelling from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. The checks applied even if the goods will remain in the Northern Ireland itself. See, this particular Northern Ireland protocol made transfer of even the basic essential goods from United Kingdom to Northern Ireland difficult and expensive. So, the Unionist party, which I told you earlier, wanted this Northern Ireland protocol to be dropped out. They felt that these checks create a border between Northern Ireland and the rest of UK. Apart from this, businesses also complained that the checks created extra costs and delays. So, this is the reason why a new Windsor framework was signed. This new deal is aimed at significantly reducing the number of checks. Here, two lanes would be created for goods arriving in Northern Ireland from Great Britain. 
Firstly, a green lane for goods which will remain in Northern Ireland will be created. This green lane will not involve any checks. Secondly, a red lane for goods which may be sent on to the Republic of Ireland which is part of the European Union will be made. Here in the red lane, checks and inspections will be carried out on the goods which is transferred there. This Windsor framework will help in fully implementing the Brexit framework. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen about the Good Friday Agreement, Northern Ireland Protocol and the newly introduced Windsor framework. We also saw about what is the difference between United Kingdom and Great Britain. With all these learned points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Take a look at this article displayed here. It is about a recently held event in Coimbatore titled Coimbatore Unlimited 2.0. In the event, there was a discussion about the creation of a district level venture capital fund to support the startups of this region. This is about the crux of the article given here. So in our discussion today, we will see what is the criteria for a company to be called as a startup. And we will also see about the authority which recognizes startups in India. Finally, we will also see about the term unicorn. First, let us look at the criteria for a startup in India. See, the government of India has defined a startup as an entity that is less than 10 years old. And this particular entity should have an annual turnover of less than 100 crores. In addition, the startup must be working towards innovation, development or improvement of products, processes or services. The startups must also have a scalable business model with high potential for employment generation or wealth creation. Finally, startups should have been formed originally by the promoters and should not have been formed by splitting up or reconstructing an existing business. These are all the criteria for declaration of a startup in India. Now coming to the question, who recognizes startups in India? To be recognized as a startup in India, the entity must register itself on the Startup India portal. After registration, it will obtain a certificate of recognition from the Department for promotion of industry and internal trade. This DPIIT is the nodal agency for the startup recognition ecosystem in India. So basically the DPIIT through a certificate of recognition can declare any particular company as a startup. Before concluding our discussion, let us see what is meant by the term unicorn. See unicorn is a term used to describe a privately held startup company that has achieved a stock market valuation of at least 1 billion dollars. See, this particular term was coined by Aylan Lee, who was a founder of Cowboy Ventures in the year 2013. Since these startups are rare like the mythical unicorns, they are called as unicorns. Some well-known unicorns in India include Paytm, Ola, Flipkart and Zomato. This is all regarding this discussion. Through this discussion, we saw about the criteria for startup declaration in India, who recognizes startups in India and finally, we also saw about the term unicorn. With all these points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Now have a look at this article displayed here. It says that ISRO has successfully conducted the flight acceptance test of the CE20 cryogenic engine. See this particular engine is only going to power the cryogenic upper stage of launch vehicle Mach 3 of the Chandrayaan 3 mission. And recently also Chandrayaan 3 lander had undergone a test called the electromagnetic interference and compatibility test. This is what is given in this article. Using this opportunity, now let us see the objectives of the Chandrayaan 3 mission and its components. Before starting this discussion, I want you all to watch the February 20th Hindu Daily News Analysis to get a background understanding of Chandrayaan and Chandrayaan 2 missions of ISRO. Kindly check that video to get a comparative understanding of all the three lunar missions of India. Now let's get into this discussion. See, Chandrayaan 3 is a follow-up mission to the Chandrayaan 2 mission of India. If you can remember, Chandrayaan 2 mission of ISRO was a failure. While it was successful in putting the lunar orbiter around the moon, the lander and rover of Chandrayaan 2 mission was not able to soft land on the surface of the moon. The lander which was called Vikram and the rover Pragyan while trying to land on the surface of the moon got crashed. This is what led to the failure of Chandrayaan 2 mission. Following this, ISRO brought out a plan to implement the Chandrayaan 3 mission. As ISRO was previously able to put the lunar orbiter around the moon, orbiter is not going to be part of the Chandrayaan 3 mission. Only lander and rover are going to be a part of this particular mission. Now let's see about the three main objectives of Chandrayaan 3 mission. 
The first one is to demonstrate a safe and soft landing on the lunar surface. The second one is to demonstrate the rover's roving capabilities on the surface of the moon. And finally, Chandrayaan-3 mission also plans to perform in-situ scientific observations on the surface of the moon. All the payloads in the mission caters to fulfilling these three objectives only. Now, let us see some details about the mission. See, Chandrayaan-3 consists of an indigenous lander module, propulsion module and a rover. Now, let's see about all these three components of Chandrayaan-3 mission one by one. First of all, let us see about the propulsion module. See, this module will carry the lander and rover configuration to about 100 kilometers of lunar orbit. It contains the spectro-polarimetry of habitable planet Earth payload. This is to study the spectral and polarimetric measurements of Earth from the lunar orbit. Secondly, there is this lander module. This lander will have the capability to soft land at a specific lunar site and deploy the rover. It has four payloads. We will see them one by one. Firstly, there is this Chandra surface thermophysical experiment. It will measure the thermal conductivity and temperature of the moon. Secondly, it contains the instrument for lunar seismic activity. It will measure the seismicity around the specific landing site on the moon. Thirdly, it has Langmuir probe. It will estimate the plasma density and its variation. Finally, it also contains a passive laser retro reflector array. See, this particular payload is from NASA and it is accommodated for lunar racer ranging studies. These four are the payloads which the lander module of Chandrayaan-3 is going to carry to the surface of the moon. Now, coming to the third component of Chandrayaan-3, it is the rover part. See, the rover contains the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer and laser-induced breakdown spectroscope. These two payloads are for deriving the elemental composition in the vicinity of the landing site. In simpler words, it will carry out in-situ chemical analysis of the lunar surface during the course of its mobility. This is all about the three different components of Chandrayaan-3 mission. With this, we have come to the end of this short discussion. Through this discussion, we came to know about the three different components of Chandrayaan-3 mission and also about the payloads which are present in it. With these learned points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Have a look at this news article. According to the Union Health Minister, the number of Janashudhi Kendras stood at nearly 9,082 as of January 31st. See, these Kendras are nothing but stores selling cheap generic medicines. This is part of the Pradhan Mandiri Bharatiya Janashudhi Yojana scheme. Here note that the Union Government has set the target to reach 10,000 Kendras by December this year. This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let's learn about the Pradhan Mandiri Bharatiya Janashadi Yojana Scheme. See, PM BJP is expanded as Pradhan Mandiri Bharatiya Janashadi Pariyojana. The purpose of the scheme is to provide quality medicines at affordable prices to the masses. Under this scheme, Janashadi stores are set up to provide generic drugs which are available at lesser prices. These drugs are equivalent in quality and efficacy as expensive branded drugs. Now that the scheme was initially launched by the Department of Pharmaceuticals in November 2008 under the name Janashodhi Campaign. Now let us see about the stores which provide generic medicines. See, under the scheme, detailed outlets known as Janashodhi Kendras are open to provide generic medicines at affordable prices. This only we saw in the news today. As of now, in India, there are 9,082 Janashodhi Kendras. The product baskets under this particular scheme includes 1,759 drugs and 208 surgical items. See, the prices of these products are nearly 50 to 90 percentage lesser than that of the prices of branded medicines. Here also know that medicines which are sold in these Kendras are procured only from WHO certified good manufacturing product certified suppliers. This is to ensure the quality of the products. Now, what is the significance of this particular scheme? See, the scheme ensures access to quality medicines at low cost to all sections of the population, especially the poor and deprived ones. Secondly, it reduces the out-of-pocket expenditure on medicines and thereby redefining the unit cost of treatment per person. Thirdly, it creates awareness about generic medicines through education and publicity. Because of this initiative, we can finally break the myth that quality is synonymous with only high price. Finally, it generates employment by engaging individual entrepreneurs in opening Janashodhi Kendras. 
with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we saw about the scheme called pradhan mantri jan aushadhi pariyojana with all these points in mind now let's move on to the next article discussion on february 24th 2023 a united nations general assembly resolution that condemns russia's invasion of ukraine was brought up and as always india has abstained from voting on this resolution see india has constantly resisted criticizing russia's invasion in the un with the rapidly evolving global geopolitics india's foreign policy is constantly tested the author of this article is of the opinion that in these testing times india must follow the policy of multi engagement rather than the policy of multi alignment in addition to this in this article the author has also highlighted india's evolving foreign policy since its independence further the article also presents the challenges that india is facing now and the changes that can be made to address these challenges are also discussed here know that this article was originally published on may 31st 2022 but the points discussed by the author are very relevant even today so in our discussion today we will try to learn the points mentioned in this text and context article before getting into the discussion i have highlighted the relevant syllabus for this discussion just pause the video and go through it first let us briefly see about the changing global order since the end of world war 2 post world war 2 the world became bipolar there was the us on one side and ussr on the other this phase is famously called as the cold war era both the superpowers that are us and ussr had deep distrust for one another but they did not engage in any direct conflict in 1991 a major transition happened with the collapse of the ussr the cold war era came to an end post 1991 that is post the collapse of ussr the world has become majorly unipolar with the us being the only superpower both in the economic terms and military terms there was no other country to challenge the hegemony of usa the world has been unipolar since 1991 but currently this is changing there are various signs that show that the world is undergoing a transition the usa's status as the only superpower is slowly eroding The two major events that currently shows the declining clout of the USA is the USS withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan after 20 years of war and secondly Russian invasion of Ukraine which is challenging the security equilibrium in Europe. In addition to these two major events the rising economic might of China also shows that there is a major transition that is going to take place in the global order. This particular transition in the global order is making it difficult for foreign policy makers of middle powers like India. Here what is meant by middle power? See in international relations a middle power is a country that is not a superpower but still has large influence and international recognition. India, Australia, Brazil, Egypt, Japan are famous examples of the term middle power. So having gone through the changes seen in the global order since World War 2 Now we will discuss about India's foreign policy since its independence. When India got its independence, the world was in the Cold War era. India, fresh out of British rule, had a challenging task of framing its foreign policy in an ideologically divided world. So, India opted for a middle path and followed the principle of non-alignment. On the hindsight, many people are of the opinion that India by being too idealistic and following the principles of non-alignment had lost more than it gained but the author of this article is of the opinion that this view is too simplistic he says that India has been more pragmatic than idealistic in its foreign policy since its independence he gives out two events that highlights India's pragmatism during the early independence years first event is around the formation of the non-alignment movement In the 1950s when then Chinese premier Mr Zhou Enlai proposed the creation of the Afro Asian Secretariat our former prime minister Mr Nehru opposed it Nehru was of the opinion that creation of Afro Asian Secretariat will create a third block in addition to the western and eastern blocks he felt that it will lead to further chaos in the world order but in the 1960s after the formation of CENTO and CETO India was pragmatic enough to superate the non-alignment movement. Here CENTO means the Central Treaty Organization and CETO means the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. The second incident is India's shift towards the USSR. India lived up to the true spirit of non-alignment movement till the 1970s. 
But in the 1970s, due to failing relations between China and USSR, China started moving towards USA. This rightly prompted India to make a pragmatic move and shift its attention towards the USSR. Here, you may know that though India tilted towards the USSR in the 1970s, it did not directly get into a military alliance with the USSR. This shows that India, while being pragmatic, did not give up its ideals. Both these incidents highlight the pragmatic and idealistic nature of Indian foreign policy during the times of the non-alignment movement itself. Post the collapse of USSR and India's 1991 LPG reforms, India started to realign its foreign policy. India started to rework its relationship with the USA and started itself to integrate with the global economy. India continued to maintain close defense and strategic ties with Russia also. Having gone through India's evolving foreign policy, now let us see the challenges that India is presently facing. The first challenge is that in the present scenario, India cannot opt for non-alignment as it did in the 1960s. See, during the Cold War era, the main center of conflict was in Europe. So, India had the choice of opting for non-alignment. But currently, with tensions between USA and China increasing, the main center of conflict will be in Asia. So, India has to make a choice. This is the first major challenge that India is facing. The second major challenge is the tension between India and China. During the Cold War era, the superpowers were the USA and USSR. And India did not have any major conflict between both these superpowers. But in the present scenario, China is very close to USSR in both its military and economic might. So, with a pinch of salt, we can say that China is a superpower. Unlike the earlier days, India has many conflicts with a superpower which is China. The situation is further complicated by China's support to Pakistan. In addition to this, the power imbalance between India and China is widening day by day. All these factors will push India towards the USA and the West. This is the second major challenge discussed by the author. The third challenge is the complications caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. See, as you all know, Russia is a traditional and long-term ally of India. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has prompted the West to issue numerous sanctions against Russia. The US and its allies, whose help India needs to counter China, are asking India to take a stand which is against Russia. But India is of the opinion that isolating Russia right now will push it towards China. So, India is basically caught between a rock and a hard place. This is the third major challenge in India's foreign policy in the present scenario. Although these are the challenges that India is currently facing, there are some solutions to address these challenges which the author discusses in this article. Now, let us see them one by one. The first solution is to learn from the Chinese experience. See, Soviet Union was China's ideological brother and neighbor during the Cold War era. But due to some difference of opinion with the Soviet Union, China started aligning itself with the US in the 1970s. But aligning itself with the US, China started to make rapid economic strides. With economic growth, China also started to augment its military might. Fast forward 50 years, now China is challenging the USA itself. Likewise, India must focus on transforming itself economically and militarily. Through this, India must first try to bridge the gap between India and China. Once India grows economically and militarily, it will slowly transform itself into a stabilizing power in the Indo-Pacific region which can counter the influence of China. Secondly, India must stay away from making any military alliance with the USA. The author is of the opinion that India must not align with the USA and the West to counter China. This is because, firstly, it will anger China under long-term ally which is Russia. Secondly, if India aligns with the USA, India will lose its strategic autonomy and cannot engage with countries like Iran. Lastly, India must follow the principle of multi-engagement with the middle countries. During the Cold War era, the world was bipolar, but currently that is not the case. Even though we have the USA at the top and China in the second position, there are many middle powers which have huge influence and international recognition. So, the author states that India must not align with either China or the USA. And he further says that India must give up the policy of multi-alignment. Rather, India must engage with countries like Australia, Japan, Brazil, South Africa and South Korea for long-term peace and stability. This will also prevent India from getting sucked into any military bloc. This is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about India's evolving foreign policy, 
the challenges faced by India in the sphere of foreign policy and the steps that can be taken to address these challenges. With these points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Now let's take this lead editorial article for our next discussion. See the article talks about the revamped version of Adopt a Heritage Scheme. The author of this article analyzed the scheme and identified some of the issues with it. He also suggests some of the measures that can be taken to improve the scheme. So in this news article discussion, let us understand them one by one. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this particular discussion is highlighted here. Interested aspirants can pause the video and quickly go through it. Now, before understanding about the revamped scheme, first let us understand what is meant by Adopt a Heritage and who are Monument Mitras. See, Adopt a Heritage Scheme was an initiative of the Ministry of Tourism in collaboration with the Ministry of Culture and Archaeological Survey of India. It was launched in September 2017 on World Tourism Day by our former President Ramnath Govind. Under the Adopt a Heritage Scheme, the government invites entities including public sector companies, private sector firms as well as individuals to develop selected monuments and heritage and tourist sites across India. Here, development of these tourist sites means for providing and maintaining both basic amenities and advanced amenities. Basic amenities include drinking water, ease of access for the differently abled and senior citizens, cleanliness, public conveniences and illumination, etc. On the other hand, advanced amenities include the surveillance systems, night viewing facilities, tourism facilitation centers, etc. Here note that depending on tourist footfall and visibility, the monuments were separated into three categories. The three categories were green, blue and orange. Iconic sites like the Taj Mahal, Kutub Minar and Red Fort were characterized as green, while Purana Kila and Jantar Mantar fell into the blue category. The Sanchi Stupa is one of the popular sites in the orange category. Entities were encouraged to adopt from the blue and orange category or a mix of three. Adoption of only green category is not allowed. You can see the conditions here. So, according to the scheme, sites and monuments can be adopted by private and public sector companies and individuals. People who adopt a monument were known as Monument Mitras. Monument Mitras are allowed to adopt the monument for an initial period of 5 years. The most competitive and innovative vision would be considered as the criteria for the successful bidding entity to choose the entity which is going to look after the monument. The monument mitras are selected by the Oversight and Vision Committee, co-chaired by the Tourism Secretary and the Department of Culture Secretary. There is no financial bid involved. The corporate sector is expected to use the corporate social responsibility funds for the upkeep of the site. The monument mitras in turn will get limited visibility on the site premises and on the Incredible India website. The Oversight Committee will also have the power to terminate a Memorandum of Understanding in case of non-compliance or non-performance. Under this scheme, the government has put a list of over 93 ASI monuments. But so far, only 10 monuments have been adopted under this Adopt a Heritage Scheme. Since the scheme couldn't perform to its fullest potential, the government has now decided to revamp the scheme. This revamped scheme is only called as Monument Mitra Scheme. Here, the government is now planning to conclude partnership with the public sector units, private or individuals for as much as 1000 monuments. The revamped version was launched on February 15th this year. The government has set up a target to sign a memorandum of understanding for 500 sites before August 15th. The MOU of remaining 500 sites will be signed shortly thereafter. The top government sources said that the newly revamped scheme will project India as a cultural superpower during the year-long presidency of the G20. But the issue here is the numbers. The target fixed by the new revamped scheme shows a tenfold increase in the number of sites previously brought under the Adopt a Heritage Scheme of 2017. And this is where the author also finds the issue. Now let us see the issues one by one. Firstly, the scheme says that anyone can adopt a monument if they have competitive and innovative vision. In such cases, businesses will be more interested in using their CSR funds to select sites to construct and maintain ticket offices, restaurants, museums, interpretation centers, toilets and walkways. It will be done to market their own brands by occupying prime public land. Secondly, many monuments selected for the scheme already have tourist infrastructure. 
the author questions about the need for including these monuments into the new list of 1000 monuments another danger of implementing the revamped adopt a heritage scheme is that it will undermine local communities and their relationship with historical sites take for example the guided tours led by employees of large businesses who have received permission to adopt a monument they may endanger the livelihoods of those who have lived nearby and made a living by entertaining visitors with stories from the site's colorful past night tourism will also pull electricity away from rural homesteads and hospitals these are some of the issues identified by the author in this particular monument mitra scheme now let us look at some of the solutions for this problem firstly the author says that corporate india instead of taking care of nation's built heritage they can help citizens understand why monuments matter this can be done by allocating csr funds to grants for researching writing and publishing high quality history textbooks corporates can also help in developing innovative and effective methods of teaching history to the new age population their csr funds can also be used to purchase new equipments that can support the meaningful conservation of heritage buildings With this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we have seen about adopt a heritage and monument mitra scheme we further saw about the issues present in the revamped monument mitra scheme and also some of the solutions which was suggested by the author in the editorial with these learn points in mind now let's move on to the next part of our hindu daily news analysis which is nothing but the prelims practice question discussion today i have taken five different questions for our discussion four will be discussed by me and one will be the quiz question for you Now let's start with the first question. See it is a two statement question and the question is regarding proton beam therapy. The question wants us to find the correct statements. Now coming to statement 1. Proton beam therapy for the treatment of cancer has no side effects at all. See this statement is incorrect. Even though proton beam therapy has far less side effects when compared to other radiation therapies, it does have certain side effects. They include fatigue, hair loss, skin redness, soreness etc. So statement one is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement. Proton beam therapy cannot be used to treat cancers in crucial spaces like brain and spinal cord. See the statement is incorrect. Proton therapy is mainly useful for treating tumors that are near the most important parts of our body. For instance, cancers near the brain can be treated using this particular therapy. So statement 2 is also incorrect. So the correct answer for this question is option D neither one nor two. Now moving on to the second question. This is also a two statement question and here also we have to find out the correct statement. The question is regarding states startup ranking 2021. Now coming to the first statement. The ranking is published by Niti Aayog. See the statement is incorrect. State startup ranking is not published by Niti Aayog. It is published by Ministry of Commerce and Industry. See this is being done to promote competition between states regarding startups. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement. In the 2021 ranking Gujarat and Karnataka appeared as the best performers in the states category. See the statement is correct. These are the two states with a high number of startups in them. So statement 2 is correct. So the correct answer for this question is option B 2 only. Now moving to the third question. The question is regarding Janna Shadi Kendra Two statements are given and we have to find the correct statement. Now coming to the first statement. Anyone can open a Janna Shadi Kendra under the Pradhan Mandri Bharatiya Janna Shadi Pariyojana Scheme without any conditions. See, first part of the statement is correct. Anyone can open a Janna Shadi Kendra under the said scheme. But there is a condition which needs to be satisfied. The condition is that the applicant have to employ at least one B Pharma or D Pharma degree holder as pharmacist in the proposed store. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement. Pradhan Mandri Bharatiya Janna Shadi Pariyojana is implemented by Pharmaceutical and Medical Devices Bureau of India. See this statement is correct. It is implemented by the said agency only. But note one important point. Pharmaceutical and Medical Devices Bureau of India functions under the Bureau of Pharmaceuticals. You may first instance think that this department of pharmaceuticals will be functioning under the Ministry of Health. But that is not the case. It does not function under the Ministry of Health. but it functions under the ministry of chemicals and fertilizers so statement 2 is correct the correct answer for this question is option b 2 only now coming to the fourth and final question let me read out the question first windsor fame mark recently seen in news is related to which of the following from our discussion itself we know that windsor fame mark is a protocol to reduce the friction between great britain and northern ireland relating to trade so the correct answer is option a 
the quiz question is displayed here interested aspirants can post the correct answer in the comment section the mains practice question is displayed here interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of our discussion if you have liked our video please hit the like button do comment and share it with your friends thank you for listening